So hopefully that's working. Just confirm for me that uh, you can hear me loud and clear. And um, this is your every single AQA A-level physics required practical. I hope it's really, really useful to you. I say, just give me a shout in the chat if you can hear this loud and clear because there's something went a bit funny when I started the stream. Um, but this is going to be a really, really quick run through of all the OCR practicals. That is not to say if you are doing a different exam board, this is not useful to you because there are lots and lots of similarities. As I've talked through in a previous live stream and loads before as well, there are just some um, apparatus and techniques that every exam board has to cover. And each exam board does a set of required practicals or PAGs or um, core practicals they're called in Excel all of them um, <laughs> all of them are uh, the, to meet those same criteria so they're useful for us all thanks a lot Nick right that's great thanks a lot Josh glad, glad to have you all here with us and um, we're just going to jump into it now um, but what I suggest you do is you see my little explanations as being kind of like you know a simple description of how the practical works you know maybe you'd be asked to describe a practical to measure this describe a practical to measure that um, then you, you know this is the type of answer that you'd give and I've always been careful to describe how's that going that should be back now let me know if that is any better I think I've figured out what the issue was let's do one more thing on this computer as well Hopefully that should be better. All right, no, I'm not going for good. All right, so sorry about that. Um, skip forward to this point if you're watching this recorded. Make sure you are subscribed um, because I'll be coming live a couple more times before paper free. That's better, that's good. Okay, I'm glad to hear that, right? Um, so uh, essentially, so as I said, that's great news. Okay, it's all better. Um, there's almost, uh, see these as being like free mark answers to describe how practical works. See these. Uh, some of them a bit more descriptive, some of them a bit more some evaluative points or some how you analyze things, some key things that they might ask you about each practical. Um, see this as useful for every single exam board. And what I want you to actually do is I want you to think about what's come up so far in paper one and paper two and think therefore what might be likely to um, what might be likely to come up in this paper three. So if they've covered a lot of waves, then the waves pag, the waves, sorry, required practical is less likely to come up than one of the others. So I know what that's like for LXL because I've seen the LXL papers, but I haven't seen the AQA papers. So in the chat, in the chat, why not just mention to each other uh, as you're going through or in the comments, if you're watching this later, or if you're watching this in a year's time in the comments, what you're expecting to come up, which practicals you think are more likely to come up um, on this paper three that's coming up for you mention that so other people get the benefit of your wisdom and what you noticed and so they can focus on the right things okay well i hope that's really helpful um i've also got uh, you can find all the lxl ones on my channel and i've also got all of the um ocr ones which i just went through earlier on they'll be useful as i say even if you're doing aqa because i hope you're here because you're doing AQA, um, they would be useful for you to go through all the different ones for the exam boards because they can ask you to do a similar related practical with maybe a slightly different method so that is well worth having a look at. I'm just going to change one thing. And I apologize for that error at the start. Um, that was like playing computer games when I was a kid online. <laughs> okay, and we're good to go. All right. Let's go into the visualizer. So here's the first one, and this is uh, mass per unit length of a standing wave. Okay, so um, mass per unit length of standing waves on a string, find the fundamental frequency of a length of string. So the fundamental frequency is that which produces a standing wave of just one antinode. So if you've got between two points, when you're having a standing wave that looks like this, which has just got one big wobble in the middle, a node here, an antinode here, and a node here, that is the frequency is F naught, and that also is lambda over two, it's half a wavelength, right? So what you're going to do is you're gonna produce one of those with a vibration generator and with a signal generator, and you need to use a signal generator attached to an oscilloscope 
to actually measure this accurately. So I've done a little thing here because one thing they want you to know is how to use an oscilloscope accurately. We always make sure that the waveform is as large as possible by changing the volts per division on our oscilloscope to make the waveform as large as possible. That keeps our percentage uncertainty as small as possible because we've got the, the smallest division we can use and we've got the largest thing we can use. Um, so just remember that and also the time base. Now you can change the time base on a silicone to just show one wave and then that again that does it as large as possible and um, we can uh, and, uh, use a smaller scale as possible so we have the, the smallest possible percentage uncertainty. However if they give you an oscilloscope trace like this then make sure you use as many waves as you can. So that's one, two, three, four full waves. If I read off that time I've got four times the time period so the time period I can just have that time divide by four to give me the time period. So make sure that you do those things. Those things are ways in which we can ensure that we have as small as possible percentage uncertainty, and that's a really massive idea, okay, in um, in A level physics and especially in the practical stuff. Then what they do basically you vary the length of the string by having two fixed wooden blocks. So in the AQA practical they clamp the string to one end. They have a wooden block that's like just sort of like a bridge almost for the for the string to rest on. Then they have the wave going between another wooden block and then the rest of the string on a little pulley with a tension down here. Okay, so you actually vary this length here and you're looking for the different harmonics. So vary the tension, vary the length of the string between one and a half a meter. Then they want you to plot one over F against um, length, okay, this L being here, length, and what did I say, one over F against length. And then here's the bit where I get uh, knocked off at AQA because why on earth, this gives you a straight line, great, okay, with the gradient being uh, two over C. So rather than just going ahead and working out the wavelength and plotting one over the frequency versus the wavelength, or rather inverse that, like length over, you know, if you just plot wavelength and one over the frequency, then you get a graph where the speed is the gradient. So I don't know why they don't do this, but actually what you get here is um, you use the C equals two over the gradient to work out the wave speed. So it's just like, this is the way around they do it. You have to kind of accept that. This is not wrong, but this is the way around they do it in LXL. Okay, so you can then go ahead and vary the tension if you want and do that, or you can go ahead and vary and do it for different harmonics. So you can take readings where you get one full wavelength and second uh, full wavelength and so on and so forth. There's loads of different things. Um, human snake, the, um, that would be based on the relative size of the scale division or the more or how many waves you have so that that could be different for a different thing it's not um it's not set in stone either way of doing that is perfectly acceptable either have the time base as small as possible so you get as just one full wave or measure many waves and uh, and divide by how many there are okay so young's double slits is one that, that people don't really like very much and i think the way aqa do this is a bit funny like it's a bit weird like what why have they done it with both a um, double slit and a separate diffraction grating um, as two separate experiments. Okay, and it's quite an interesting idea actually. So for the first one, with just a, a double slit, then what you get is this, um, you get this fringe pattern, but it's very small. Okay, so even a couple of meters, it's only gonna be like, uh, you know, less than 10 centimeters wide on the screen. So what you do then is you count the number of fringes and you measure the whole thing. And what you do is you divide the, the width of the whole thing by the number of fringes, and that gives you your fringe width. And that again is doing that exact same thing of minimizing the percentage of uncertainty. And you're gonna use a vernier scale. So you're gonna use vernier calipers, which give you 0 0.01 um, uh, scale. So you are reducing the percentage of uncertainty as much as possible. So I'm gonna keep talking about this percentage of uncertainty. Think about any measurement has an uncertainty. That's delta, the measurement, delta x and divide that by the actual measurement. So if you can make the measurement, the thing we're measuring as large as possible, or we can make the uncertainty by having a smaller scale division, if we can make that as, as small as possible and that as big as possible, then we can keep our percentage uncertainty as low as possible. And that is a massive idea with being accurate. And that is a really important thing for, for you to look at. So um, they've got that idea in there. Um, and then because the, the angle is very small, 
you can actually just use this equation here. Uh, lambda equals uh, the W, which is the width of the thing, um, the separation, which is the gap between the two slits on the uh, on the Young's double slit thing, and D, capital D, which is the distance to the screen. And you can use this because uh, W over A, W over D is um, or rather s over d is very like close to uh, to zero basically it's very close to um, what do I say this is basically the small angle approximation so now when we talk about the next practical that hopefully will make a little bit more sense because when you use a diffraction grating you get a much larger gap between the fringes so you can measure those accurately with just a ruler so you get this really large gap between the fringe here and you can then use tan uh, to the minus one h over d, h being the gap between the um, zeroth order and the first or second or third order maximum, and I've actually done those wrong. I'm right, zero, one, two, um, three, and you can use tan to the minus one this distance, this distance over this distance, to give you this angle here, and that's the angle that we're actually interested in in our equation. Uh, n lambda equals d sine theta where d is the slit separation of the diffraction grating and sine theta is sine of this angle that you've worked out by measuring h and d and by doing a bit of trig so the point i'm trying to make in the first one is sine of that angle is still pretty small but the, for, for the first one it's basically the same as slit separation over, over distance. Okay, so that's the two ways to do that experiment. It's a blooming nuisance, that one, but this makes far more sense. This is the way I've always done it in the lab because you get much larger values of H, so your percentage uncertainty is lower with a ruler. Whereas with the, just with the double slit uh, practical, you, you, um, you, the thing you're measuring is so small, you have to use calipers to get a small enough percentage uncertainty. Okay, and it uses this horrible small angle approximation. Okay, next one is G by free fall. So required practical free is G by free fall. So what you're going to do here is you're gonna re release a ball bearing from an electromagnet. Now you don't need to use an electromagnet, but we'll talk about why that's a useful thing to have later. And you're gonna have two light gates and between them, you're gonna measure the distance H. Okay, and then you use the equation of motion H or S equals UT plus a half uh, a t squared, so g t squared in this case. Um, you're going to use this and you're going to rearrange uh, into a equation here, 2h over t equals g t plus 2u. And what that means is you now got the equation y equals m x plus c. And you can plot the 2h over t on this axis and you can plot uh, t on this axis and that gives you a gradient of g and an intercept of 2u. Will that be positive? Yeah. Okay, gradient of g and an intercept of 2u. So here's why it doesn't matter why we that we use the electromagnet because we're not timing from this point, we're timing between our two light gates, light gate A and light gate B, which is what the computer will allow you to do. Um, we're timing from here to here, but we need u to be constant. We need the in original speed, the initial velocity as it goes through like a a to be a constant. So we need the electromagnet to be a set distance. We need to control this distance and make sure this doesn't change in our practical. Otherwise, we won't get this constant. We won't get the intercept being 2u. Does that make sense? Um, I, I hope so. It's an important one. There are other ways to do this. There are other ways to do g by free fall. And most most um, exam boards have you compare different methods. So comparing like um, using a stopwatch and having that random uncertainty due to human reaction time uh, with one of these methods, a light gate method or maybe an electronic timing method. They have you actually comparing how accurate you get. But I like this. It's a clever way of not having to actually measure the initial speed and just the time between two points, manipulating the algebra, which is a core skill for these practicals here. Moving on then, Young Modulus. So Young Modulus, um, in AQA is the, the one um, exam board that insists on you doing it with a reference wire and clamping from a fixed point on the ceiling. So you actually clamp something where you can hang two wires 
in this method and you have a pre-tensioned reference wire and you have to tension them both before taking any measurements to get out any kinks. So you actually have uh, basically 10 newtons, one kilogram on the reference wire and before you do anything you also have um, 10 newtons on your test wire. Okay, And then you add one kilogram or half kilogram depending on what you have available um, to your wires. Now they have to be quite large because the AQA asks for you to do steel. So steel obviously has a very high young, young modulus, it's a very strong material. So um, this has on it a little vernier scale. So here we use vernier scales which give us a resolution of 0.1 millimeter. So again we're thinking about getting our percentage uncertainty low this time by yeah, by having this distance as large as possible, so you want about 1.5 meters of wire, um, but also by keeping our scale as small as possible. And then once again, um, AQA annoy me by doing some complicated stuff for something that is very, very simple. So normally we would say, well, the young modulus is a gradient of a stress over strain graph. That's the way I'm completely used to thinking about stuff. It's totally easy. You measure your cross-sectional area using vernier, no, sorry, using micrometers. I think I've said that somewhere in here. Measure dams using micrometer, or they even ignore that in this practical, and they just say use the kind of manufacturer's value of being like 0.45 millimeters, um, the thickness of the wire that you've been given, if you like. You can look up the SU, SWG in any kind of um, in any kind of book of values to give yourself a, a too significant figure value for the diameter or you can use the micrometer in three different places maybe taking pairs of readings at right angles to each other to give yourself a diameter hence calculate an area anyway that's how you get the area the original length you measure with a ruler probably um it's about 1.5 meters but it should be as accurate as you can can measure that and obviously the force is just whatever the mass is times 9.81 um so this makes perfect sense to me, but Edex, uh, sorry, AQA aren't happy with that. They want to complicate uh, things. So they want you to plot extension versus load. You know, why, I don't know why you do it like this, but anyway, this is what they want you to do. That should still give you a straight line. But then the gradient would be, uh, well, whatever it is, but here they've done it here. So then the young modulus is the length over the area times the gradient. So I don't know why they've complicated things, but really it's just a matter of being able to think about your values, think about what is represented by the gradient, and therefore work back to whatever you're trying to work out. This makes far more sense to me now. Okay, moving on then, resistivity. So resistivity, you're gonna take a length of wire and you're gonna vary that length. It's gonna be a, stretched across a meter ruler normally. So that's how you're measuring the length. And then you have a circuit really with either with a um, voltmeter and uh, ammeter that's the way they specify to do it in uh, AQA or you can just use a multimeter to get the resistance and you're essentially just going to vary the length of wire in the circuit and you're going to measure the PD for it and you're going to measure the voltage and you're going to calculate the resistance using V over I and you can plot resistance against length and then the gradient times the cross-sectional area is the resistivity. So resistivity is gradient times the area. Again, this is a bit more confusing than I think it needs to be because if you just take your algebra and manipulate it, you can put the resistivity as being the gradient. That's no big deal. I think this is quite an interesting way of doing it because they do talk about you having to actually keep the current constant. And you keep the current constant in this one because current causes heating which increases resistance and here this is where they do do the bit this is the practical they do specify you must measure diameter um, with a micrometer in more than three places okay and find a mean so you're expecting some random error there a bit of uncertainty and so you repeat and find a mean when that's the, the situation right then it's emf and internal resistance which is the classic one I've talked about quite a bit over the last few days. So I'm not going to do this one to death here, uh, but what you do is you plot the potential difference across a load resistance, which you vary against the current, and you get a graph where the gradient is the internal resistance and the y-intercept is the EMF. Okay, again, 
um, think about ideas as what can cause and how to reduce errors. So in this case, you get a systematic error if you're going to heat up the wire. So similar idea as the last one. Um, so you need to leave the circuit on for as little time as possible. And you don't also want to, um, you, you want to avoid that heating effect by leaving your current, your circuit on for as little time as possible. But you also don't want your battery to kind of run out of energy. So it reduces its kind of store of chemical energy, then uh, or chemical store of energy, then you are going to get a lower EMF and that's no longer going to be constant. But I shouldn't have thought in the time doing a practical it's going to change by that much, but they specify that as being a thing. So you want to avoid your systematic errors as much as possible. Moving on to the F13 stuff now. So simple harmonic motion of pendulums and mass spring systems. Nice and straightforward. Think about you can actually use a stopwatch to get accurate readings of time for these. If you do these things, if you use a fiducial marker, so that means like you've got a pendulum and you leave a little mark at the equilibrium position. So as it swings, you've got a timing marker basically that you can look at. It goes left through that thing. That's, that's when it's completed one full swing. And you're gonna time 10 full swings and that's gonna minimize your percentage uncertainty. So again, you, you've got, instead of chiming just one time, you're gonna time 10 time periods and then you're gonna divide that answer by 10 because the uncertainty is in your timing. Um, so if you if you make what your timing larger, then your, your timing uncertainty is smaller as a percent of what you are measuring. And then when you divide that by 10, you also divide the uncertainty by 10 and therefore you get a more accurate value of time. So make sure you state that. There are other ways of doing this though. You could use an ultrasonic position, position sensor. And if you use an ultrasonic position sensor, then you actually get a nice little sine wave uh, and you can measure, you know, you can read off that sine wave if you've got maybe four full swings or something from your sine wave. Then you can read off the time for, for doing four of them or however many you can get, 10 of them on a graph or whatever. And again, you can therefore get um, a more accurate value of the time period. And that's what this is all about because for pendulums, the time period is equal to two pi root L over G. G is obviously fixed and L is something you can vary. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna vary the length of the pendulum and you're therefore going to plot, um, you're going to, going to plot a graph such that your, uh, such that G is gonna be your gradient. Okay, so how would you do that? Square both sides, so four pi squared L over G. So now I can plot L as my x-axis, T squared as my y-axis, and my gradient is four pi squared over G. Okay, hope that makes sense. That will give me an accurate measurement of G if I wanted to use it to do that. Now, similarly with the uh, mass spring systems, uh, the equation is T equals two pi root M over K. And again, you can vary M or K by changing either how many springs you've got or, um, or changing the mass on them. And that will change the time period. You can do a similar bit of algebra and work, your, work, your, uh, work out your other constant in that way. So um, you can use an ultrasonic position sensor, which is literally what you have on the car or it's a version of what you use to scan uh, fetal scans. It sends out a wave pulse and then receives the echo, receives the reflection, and therefore works out a distance by that. Okay, um, the, you can also use light gates. So most log data logging systems have a syst uh, setting where you can put a light gate in the middle here, and it will measure essentially the time period because it knows every time that um, light gate gets broken, the beam gets broken, that's half the time period, the gap between them. So it will work out the time period for you. And you could do that with a mass spring system as well. So Boyle's law and Charles law then. So Boyle's law is um, that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So that's what you're aiming for. Pressure and volume being inversely proportional. Uh, you, I quite like this method. I've never tried this method. Tell me if this gets you a good, um, good inverse proportionality. That's what it's really all about. Should give you a straight line. It's about verifying Boyle's law. What they do is they take a clamped syringe like upside down. So this is the syringe and hang masses from it. Okay, so as you add mass, you're basically putting more and more force onto the syringe. So the, the trapped gas inside the syringe should expand as you add more force. So you should get a greater volume with more force. That's kind of the, the opposite way to think about. So what you're actually doing is by hanging mass on here, you're reducing the pressure. So you calculate the pressure using force over area, the area of the actual uh, 
barrel of the syringe and then you take that pressure that force of area from atmospheric pressure to give the pressure in the syringe so you're actually hanging it on it and actually reducing the pressure each time which is really really interesting i'll just talk through all the all the ocr ones and they do pretty much the same practical right but the way they do it is um is that they stack the uh, slotted masses on top of the syringe so you're increasing the pressure and you're measuring the decrease in volume if you like so there's you know there are different ways to achieve the same goal Okay, I don't particularly want to talk about cats at the minute, but there are different ways to achieve the same goal in these, uh, you know, the, and different exam boards just do the same thing differently. Interesting, right? So um, Charles Law is another good one. So this uses air sealed in a capillary tube. So you take a beaker of water, like a nice big beaker of hot water normally, and you have mounted on a ruler, you have a little capillary tube, and your technicians have sealed some air. There's a little kind of bit of either mercury or um, concentrated acid, which is sealing some air into the base of the tube here. And you're gonna allow temperature to vary and you're gonna measure the volume. You're not directly measuring the volume, you're actually measuring the length, but that length is proportional to the volume. And then you're gonna plot volume against temperature and you're gonna get readings up here between like 100 degrees and zero degrees. And that should give you a straight line, but it doesn't go through the origin. Okay, um, because our zero degrees Celsius is not is not absolute zero. So what we can do then is we can extrapolate back and wherever that meets the x-axis, the x-intercept, that is zero degrees Kelvin. And it should be minus 273 degrees Celsius. So that's a really interesting practical. And actually, if you repeat that several times, you get wildly different um, x-intercepts but on average they do come out roughly around 300 so let, let me know how if you've done that one and if you've how close you've got to absolute zero okay they don't do in this one they don't do the pressure law uh, which is pressure and temperature being proportional charging and discharging capacitors okay um, this one is I'm just going to talk mainly about discharging them okay but the, the, the maths is very very similar if when you discharge a capacitor you should see if it's voltage this could be current or charge, you should see an exponential decay like so. Um, and that therefore corresponds to the equation V, that's, that's the voltage at any time, potential difference at any time, equals V naught, which is the maximum, the initial, E to the minus uh, T over RC. So that's an important number, RC. It's known as the time constant because it has units seconds. And um, essentially what you need to do is you need to choose values of R and C such that RC is in the range 10 seconds to 500 seconds. That is gonna give you a large enough period of time, a large enough interval between readings to be able to time accurately with the stopwatch. So you're looking for readings every five or 10 seconds or maybe even longer than that, 30 seconds, um, a minute, whatever. You're looking for actually designing a circuit such that R and C will give you accuracy with human um, timing. You can do things with a, uh, you know, with oscilloscopes, or you can do things with audacity, or you can do things. Well, the way I've done this in my video um, is actually film the the um, the multimeter, and the multimeter refreshes every 0.4 of a second. So that gives me a time base of 0.4 of a second. And that's really quite interesting. But there you go. Um, that's how you do it. And then to get that into a straight line, you log both sides basically. Lun V equals uh, minus T over RC plus Lun V naught. And that is Y equals MX plus C. So you plot Lun V there and you plot time there and you should get a gradient of minus one over RC. Okay, so, um, and an intercept of Lun V naught. Now the uh, charging is exactly the same but it looks like this. Now, interestingly, that that's voltage and time. That is is growing, is increasing, but still an exponential decay because it's increasing at a decreasing rate. And that's the important thing to understand about this. And this equation would look something like this. V equals V naught, which would be this final um, voltage now, fully charged voltage, uh, times one minus e to the minus t over rc. So e to the minus t over rc gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it approaches these two things being equal. In other words, as this value in the brackets approaches one. So you should be able to find those two things in that experiment, essentially. Oh, I'll just quickly draw a circuit diagram so I haven't done one of these yet um, today. So if you've got a power supply, which is maybe like six volts, normally what we put it on for this a stack of four um, 1.5 volt cells you can have your um, 
capacitor in here. You can have a um, voltmeter across it and you can then have your resistor over this side. Now I don't intend to use a little switch but the point is what we do is we disconnect from this side and we just connect to this side for decay. So we are just uh, discharging through this resistor essentially. So we charge it up by connecting this wire. I normally just have a little flying wire that I can change from here to here. Um, and I'm disconnecting from the power supply and then connecting to here, starting the timer and taking readings on the voltmeter as it discharges. When you charge up, you have to charge up through the resistor. So you have to put the resistor in series with the charging circuit. So in that case, um, the charge, the charging circuit just is exactly the same, but the resistor is over here and you don't need this other leg of the circuit. Okay, next bit then, motor effect is F equals B I L. So this is essentially an experiment, really quite clever. I, I really enjoy doing this type of experiment um, to measure the force basically, or measure actually the, um, the strength of a magnetic field. So it's quite interesting, right? So what you do is you have the yoke, a little, just a little, a little C-shaped bit of metal basically sat on top of a top pan balance. That's one of those things that you use to measure mass in chemistry normally with the resolution 0 0.01 grams normally. Um, and then you have magnets. They say to have two on either side and a current carrying wire in the middle. And what you can do is you can vary the current and hence you can plot a graph such that B is on the gradient. So here's again, this, this, uh, Thanks ZX, uh, AQA for making things more complicated than they really need to be. So our equation is F equals B I L, right? So all we need to do is we need to plot force on the Y axis, I L on the X axis and B is our gradient. But of course, what they ask you to do is plot M. And this reading is M and L, no, sorry, and I rather. So that's, that's the R, that's an I. That's why we, I've used capitals here. Plot M versus L sorry, M versus I, which is the current, that should give you a straight line. And then the gradient times, so the gradient is M over L. Oh, I keep saying it, M over I. Multiply that by G over L. That gives you B. The, oh, done down there, apologies. So I'll just run through that one really quickly then. So the gradient of an M over I graph uh, multiply that by G over L, which are constants. Okay, L is the length of the wire in the field. Uh, that gives you the, the magnetic field strength. Now, I think I know why why um, they decide to do it this way. It's because they maybe haven't grown up with, um, they haven't grown up with spreadsheets like we all have. So for me, I measure all the masses, all the readings on here. I record my raw data in my spreadsheet. Then I measure all the currents that I've included on the, um, uh, in the next one. And then I process my data. So I have a column for F. So I times everything by 9.81 and convert into kilograms times by 9.81. And then I do I times length as my next column. And the computer just does all that. I don't need to sit with a calculator and do all that. The computer does that really, really quickly. And then I can just tell the graph, the computer to do me a graph of this and this, and it gives me a gradient. So it's, I think the reason why they do things the long way around, they, they plot their raw data, get a gradient, and hence use the gradient to calculate something is because they're not used to using um, spreadsheets like I am. Okay, so moving on. So um, this is magnetic flux density practical. Now this one's really cool as well. Did this work out? Loads of people have been saying they really enjoyed the last one. Did this experiment work out? I've never done this in this sort of way. I've measured how uh, field strength varies with angles before, but not with this particular um, practical. Basically what they have is a large uh, circular coil, okay, which you're gonna put a alternating PD across unless you're using the whole, the whole uh, probe method. And then the um, search coil is a much smaller coil with many turns, 5,000 turns of very fine copper wire, which gets inserted into the field. Now that, that or this, so either of those two, two coils, you can vary the angle of them, doesn't matter which one you do. And you're gonna vary and you're gonna measure the output voltage on your search coil. So this is connected to a voltmeter or an oscilloscope it could be as well. Um, and that is going to give you the output voltage. And you want to look for the peak voltage. That's why an oscilloscope trace, again, is going to look something like this. 
time base isn't important this time. What is important is that you can measure the peak voltage as accurately as possible. So you measure the peak voltage by doing the full distance from top to bottom and divide by two. Uh, again, look, we've talked about give, making that as large as possible, the volts per division, to give you as accurate as possible, to give you a smaller possible percentage uncertainty is what you should be always thinking about. And you're going to plot a graph of the peak voltage versus the angle. And that, so it doesn't matter which one you change, you either make this one go towards perpendicular or from parallel to perpendicular or from perpendicular to parallel, doesn't matter. Um, yeah. This is so difficult for us to do. It sounds really, really tricky. You're going to plot angle versus um, the output voltage, peak voltage, and you should hopefully see that you get like the first 90 degrees of a sine wave shape. You could, of course, plot sine theta versus uh, versus voltage and you should get something linear. You can, instead of doing that, you can use a Hall probe, okay? So you can use a Hall probe in the um, coil here and instead of using AC, you'd use DC because a Hall probe is just a little kind of uh, plate that varies its angle um, given uh, whatever field it's in and that produces a Hall voltage. So you can read off the Hall voltmeter Okay, and you can say that voltage, the Hall voltage is analogous to the field strength, just as the voltage here is analogous to the field strength. It's just this voltage is um, induced by uh, Faraday's law, whereas the Hall voltage is induced by the Hall effect on the probe. Okay, you could also use a permanent magnet, so if you really didn't want to, or you didn't have a set of coils like this, you could actually use a Hall probe in just a permanent magnetic field. Last one for us everyone then, please. Um, so this is the inverse square law for a gamma emitter. So I'll be talking about this a little bit later when we do Dr. Lemon's uh, main tips for paper free. Um, but uh, this is the inverse square law for a gamma emitter. Uh, we do half thickness in LXL, um, but this one is just as valid, okay? So what you're going to have is you're going to have a gamma source and you're gonna vary the distance between the Geiger-Muller tube uh, we'll talk about the orientation of the Geiger Muller tube in a minute. Um, and what you should find is that the count rate is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So it's the inverse square law, just, just remember that. So um, there's some algebra in here. And so rather than plotting, um, which is what I would normally do, I would normally have my count rate on the y-axis my corrected count rate, and I would plot it against one over the distance squared or one over x squared. And I would say that'd be a straight line graph. But they don't do that. They actually plot one over c, the root of c, um, one over the square root of c on the y-axis and the distance on the x. And the reason they do that is quite clever because this is the, um, this intercept is a systematic error. So this intercept is a systematic error because actually the, the piece of, metal which is emitting the radiation is not necessarily right at the edge of the gamma source it's not necessarily right where you don't even know where it is particularly inside the sealed cup source you can't get out and have a look so it might be just here and similarly the geiger and scalar counter might be measuring ionizations that are happening here so you have this little bit of extra length here which they've called e the error the systematic error and this is this point here, this is this x intercept here. So it's actually really, really clever. So I thought to myself straight away, hmm, this is not the way around I'd normally do it. I'm not gonna change the way I do it just to be like this. To be honest, I'm quite happy with this, giving me enough accuracy, but I might, because I've got a spreadsheet, just bang through a couple of columns of data and plot this graph here as well to be able to work out my systematic uncertainty in the practical. So I hope that makes sense then. So other things with this one, this one is a good one for doing um, risk assessment on. So there's not a very high error, there's not a very high risk of um, contamination because it's a sealed source and it's a metal, it's, you know, it's glued in very thoroughly and it's checked every year by somebody at your school. Um, it, it, it is um, not a very high risk of irradiation, it's providing that you follow the inverse square law and you stay as far away from it as you can for as long as possible. You can go for short amounts of time, um, but the, the more time you can spend two meters away from it, 
the lower the actual radiation on you and so therefore the lower the dose and I'll talk about that a little bit later when we come back for lemons um, main points here so the other way you can do this is the, the, the habit is to have the Geiger Muller tube this way around so pointing at the thing but when you're using a gamma source it doesn't need to be that way around it could actually be vertical or whatever perpendicular to the gamma rays and the reason for that is very good for two reasons. You can, you can be sure, therefore, you haven't got any betas because beta will be blocked by the aluminium tube. Um, and you know you haven't got any alphas either. So the, the front of a, of a GM tube is very, very thin. It's a, like 200 atoms thick uh, mica window. And um, so alpha and beta can get in the front, but the side, gamma can get in as well. And you actually maximize the area. Because one of the issues with measurements of radiation is Sometimes the numbers can be so small that they're not very accurate. So when you're getting far away, you're getting very low numbers because of that inverse square law. And you want the values you're measuring to be as large as possible so that your percentage uncertainty is as low as possible. How many times have I said that? It's a real big clue <laughs> that that's a big deal in this paper three. Um, so if you can increase the area that's being exposed to gamma rays, then you can have a more accurate reading because you get larger numbers, so a lower percentage uncertainty. Now the um, last thing just to say is this C means corrected count rate. So the first thing you should do is you should make sure that you measure your background radiation and you take your background radiation level off all of your readings to give you the corrected count rate. Okay, that is everything that I have for you for the AQA required practicals. I hope that was helpful. Let me know in the chat now, was that helpful for you? Did you find that useful? Um, also, there's loads of good chat in this um, discussion, and if you're re if you're reading this, if you're watching this later, then um, well, hello later, hello the future. Maybe you're watching this in 2020. Whatever your exam series is that you're doing, um, what do you think is most likely to come up based on what's actually come up so far in paper one and two? Okay, um, so <laughs> I'm just gonna have a quick look through the chat. If there's any kind of um, practicals you want to come back to briefly, then we can do that. Um, if not, I am back again at five o'clock to give you Dr. Lemon's um, best tips on how to succeed in paper three. Uh, lots of people saying, Nick saying very little nuclear physics in my option. Yep. No electricity questions in paper one. So that might be a clue that that EMF one's coming up maybe. Um, AQA, I'd say inverse square law. Yep. That's the one I've just been through in a bit of detail there. G from free fall, internal resistance, resistivity. Yep. They all seem pretty sensible choices to me. Inverse square law and young modulus making up all oh, the SHM one. Maybe young modulus too. Sounds like a lot of them might come up really. Uh, electricity was worth just four marks in total on paper one. You think, okay, that's interesting, Nick. Thanks a lot. Which would give a smaller uncertainty measuring more waves or using a small time base. So no, that, as I said, either or it depends on the relative difference between those two things. So if you can fit exactly one wave on your oscilloscope, and it fits perfectly, then that's going to be the smallest possible percentage of uncertainty. But if you fit 10 on it, uh, and that fits better than one wave, then that's probably going to be a smaller percentage uncertainty than um, having the small time base. Yes, there can be error bars for both axes, uh, the AXA. Uh, I quite like that question. Um, error bars are a big deal for deciding where to put your line of best fit or deciding where your anomalies are. But in most of the time, most experiments, one thing has a much larger uncertainty than another thing. So the y-axis might have a larger uncertainty than the x-axis. And that is um, that means that you can often just decide, well, the x uncertainty is negligible compared to the y uncertainty. So I'm just gonna have my error bars in one direction. Does that make sense, Axa? Um, I guess also that is another reason why um, you might decide to plot your raw data. So you can have error bars from your raw data but again, we can with computers, <laughs> because we live in the 21st century, we can very quickly work out our error bars of any constants that we've had to measure anyway and add those in to be the upper and lower bound for each of our data point, whatever we plot. Okay, yes, you can have them in the X and the Y. Um, okay, good question. Um, I haven't missed much, just one practical. Sam, you can always go back to the beginning. You're going to need to ignore the first few minutes because we had a bit of a laggy moment. Um, I will go through and leave a comment to say start at this time or something like this. The, uh, most of the uncertainty comes from the fringe separation, right? Yeah, in, well, it, w it certainly will in the um, in the double slit version of that er of that experiment. 
uh, whereas in the diffraction grating, then it probably wouldn't be. So what we did, um, in, I'll go back to the visualizer just briefly. In my school, uh, it, with this one, is we actually went into the hall and we blacked out the entire sports hall and we had a laser over one end of the sports hall and we had as large a possible, sorry, a smaller possible slit separation to give as large a possible uh, distance between the bright fringes. And we actually got, you know, we did it down one side. So if you can imagine the sports hall was like this. Okay. So we did it down one side. So we could actually measure with a tape measure, like, you know, 10 meters or something like that. So we made these as large as possible to have a smaller possible percentage uncertainty of these values to end up with a smaller possible percentage uncertainty here. So um, a smaller possible percentage uncertainty eventually of our wavelength. Um, it's difficult to say what your percentage uncertainty of this is because it's just given as uh, like lines per millimeter. So your slit separation is just whatever it is in, um, it's 300 lines per millimeter. So one over 300 and then times by times 10 to the minus three to give you uh, the number of millimeters here and then the, the number of meters here. Okay, so it's interesting, isn't it? You, again, it's about considering what your, what the highest uncertainty is from. What's the, what's most, the, where's most the uncertainty coming from? We found this, having this value as large as possible and also D therefore is as large as possible as well, the big D down here. Um, we found that gave us the closest value to the kind of book value of the wavelength of a green laser or the value that was stated on the manufacturer um, for our red laser. So it's useful to be able to kind of uh, evaluate those things and consider what the most uncertainty is from and then, then change that, then sort of think of ways to reduce that uncertainty. And it's always by making the uncertainty itself as small as possible or making the thing that you're measuring as large as possible. Good questions, everyone. What sheet am I using for this? This is all my own little notes. I've gone through the I've gone through the AQA thing in the last live stream. I put some links to where to find out all the details for all the core practicals for the different exam boards. Basically, I've gone through those and turned them into my own um, my own notes. Um, what do I mean by small scale? The, the, the scale on the instrument, nor I mean this uh, the uh, you know the smallest possible value it can measure. Yeah, it could be a Verno. So for example, micrometers have a 0.01 um, millimeter scale. Uh, verniers have a 0.1 millimeter scale. A ruler has a one millimeter scale. Yep, thank you. Yeah, human snake, did I not say that? Um, make sure to disconnect the system every time since resistance increases with heat exactly. So if you've got current flowing, then the circuit will be heating up so you'll get a larger uncertainty a larger error actually because your resistance might be higher yeah um i like using digital cameras a lot especially for things like i don't think there is viscom uh, uh, viscosity practical in here falling ball viscometer in here but i like using um video analysis i do that quite a lot um on the experiments i've done in my channel um for any time when i need to use uh, small values of timing but cameras do have parallax error as well because they're always taking in the cone of light. So the actual distance from one side of the frame to the other is, you know, is not equal. You know, the, the distance between these two points here is not the same as the same two points over one side of my lens. Okay. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> all right. I'll, we'll try it. It probably won't look very good. It's quite a wide angle lens though. So if you look at that thing there, it should look a little bit smaller in the middle here. And a little bit larger out to one of the edges there okay um, but you can certainly see the parallel lines in corners yeah are not um, not parallel see that I don't know. so yeah you do get a parallax error with any kind of digital camera uh, the bigger the sensor the less parallax parallax error um, which is why do you know that big um, this is, and this is something they can ask you. The, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope is essentially a sensor the size of the Earth. So you have much less parallax error due to that. Yeah, what, the ultrasonic position sensor, I talked about that a couple of times, I think. So that's like the uh, position sensor. It's like the parking sensor in, in a car. I'm not sure what you mean by that, human snake. Yeah, it's, if something came up last year, it's not necessarily that it can't come up again. But what I think is important is that between the, the first two papers, they're less likely to bring up anything they've done loads on. 
Uh, good. I'm glad you like the F equals PIL experiment. I like it as well. Yeah, Human Snake said that so that you can plot direct error bars. Thank you, Human Snake. Yeah. I want to get over physics. No, no, you'll be fine, man. Okay, you've just got this, like, last few days. Mm, I can taste the end for you. I can taste finishing physics, and then you're ready to, you know, carry on your life, hopefully having a really good uh, result that you can take forward and, and prove to other people you can do this. What's the technical name for the G unaccounted space in the GM? Is it called dead space? I'm not sure. Well, in my understanding of where a GM tube works is that ionizations can happen anywhere within the tube. So I would say, actually, but I guess on average, they're going to come from sort of roughly halfway along the tube. Um, so it's a good question. Yeah, Alaya, it is undoubtedly placebo, unless you literally um, held the... Uh, so Alaya says that, you know, people felt weird after doing the radiation practical. Um, I Like, you have to kind of, you know, you have to reason it out to yourself and there's, there's definitely a very low risk of irradiation in school practicals you the amount of extra radiation you've got will be equivalent to like half a day on earth you know when you when you actually take those measurements and you think all right i'll bring the geiger miller tube over to where i'm standing for most of this practical it's like no higher than background when i when i do it from where i've been manipulating the apparatus it's like double background or something like that so it's only going to be slightly higher than just normally living here on earth so don't don't try and worry about it. unless you point it at something on your body that is going to make you feel ill there is literally no risk at all really a uh, very low risk from irradiation will i go through uncertainty at five i certainly can yeah uncertainty i mean like it's very straightforward really but yeah we'll talk about that uh, um for dr lemons certainly one thing dr lemon likes to focus on is is uncertainties when he's doing his paper free preparation Okay, so I'll do a quick run through of uncertainties. Why not? Just write it down so I don't forget. What else we got? Does just no. Lots of different practicals will come up. They'll probably ask one practical to describe. They'll probably give you data from another practical to analyze. They'll probably talk about one practical more about evaluation points. <laughs> Hernias, yeah. Um, yeah, the the um. Uncertainties of verniers are just 0.1 millimeter, and the uncertainty of micrometer is 0.01 millimeter. Yes, you would still get awarded the marks as long as it leads to valid um, results. Is the is the term we use when we're talking about whether we award marks for a different method. So if the method leads to valid results, unless they've specifically asked you and given you clues to one type of method, then you know if they said use this apparatus and this apparatus and your method uses a different piece of apparatus you're not gonna be able to get all the marks but basically yeah if, if you do it in um, any method that gives a valid result will be awarded the marks 100 percent yep thanks jai confirming that can you please take the resolution of different objects you to take measurements that'd be very helpful yeah shall i do that when i do uncertainties later on nor um what happened in 2017 is they asked you to find the gradient of line by using two lines of worse fits but um, if you don't do the method they want to you get penalized yeah, so lines of worst fit. I talked about that briefly in the in the OCR one. So I would definitely recommend going back and watching the OCR one. What Nor said. All right, cool. Um, I'm actually in the next sentence. Just want to say thank you for all of your help. That's my pleasure, Karazu. What he said. Yeah, <laughs> big hearts. Yeah, the way to do a heart. The way to give me a heart is to go on and hit that like button. Okay, I want to see that like button go around. And it's also to share out with your friends, everybody, and to um, you know to make sure that. You know, just as, as many people as I can get to watch this video because uh, there will be people who will see this like the night before and they'll be like, wow, I'm so sad that I, I found your channel the night before my exam. So if you share it out now, more, more of those people are going to be able to see this and be ready for that exam rather than panic on the night before. I can see it and that's crazy. What's that all about? Okay. Uh, with the capacitance, when you increase capacitance, what happens to the time it takes to discharge? It gets longer. So RC, the longer RC is, the um, l the the uh, the lower the rate of um, discharge. Who's Dr. Lemon? You're going to find out later on at five, aren't you? Um, I don't want to be over physics. You took you look at the world from a different perspective once you've studied at a high level, but that's just me. I absolutely agree with that. You know, I really enjoy. It, you know, when you look at a rainbow, you know, they're not just pretty colors randomly done, are they? You know, and you think to yourself, well, 
all of these interactions you know I, I can't get over this this idea of like every interaction that I have apart from gravity is basically because of uh, virtual photons interacting um, sending you know this fundamental force of electrostatic uh, electros <laughs> the fundamental force of electromagnetism between these particles and it's incredible if you have had a zero error, do you subtract it from the final value or is it just represented as an absolute uncertainty? You can do either, it depends. Um, you can do, uh, most of the time if it's a zero error, you just subtract it from the final uncert final value. The best thing to do with systematic uncertainties though is to put them either as a intercept on a graph so they don't affect the gradient therefore. You know, that is, um, that's the best way to deal with it. Or to note it down at the start and take them away from each of your results or add them whichever way it run needs to be and then use your corrected kind of uncertainty if you like put your corrected value for your final thing i enjoyed physics no matter how much you're in some areas where i'm definitely going to miss the subject yeah uh, um it's not even my degree course but i really enjoyed doing it and i love physics but i hate the exams i absolutely agree with that as well so that it, but that, that is not physics the exams aren't physics you're not you're sitting down to do an exam on monday um not to do physics and that's the annoying thing about it but uh, just get think about yourself going to get a grade that you can be really pleased with because you know you've worked hard with, for it and think about you're going to get a grade that's going to let you do what you want to do next and that's where you want to be in your life you want to be um you know like the people that you admire whatever career you want to get that this is the kind of just key to that next step in your career highly like the radiation will come since, since there was little radiation yes i do therefore um, I'm not going to guarantee that because, of course, I don't know. There's no way anyone does know um, what's going to be on these papers. Um, and I don't like to do predictions, but I think within an exam season, if they haven't asked much on paper one or two, I think you can say it's likely that that practical will come up. However, I'd love to hear from you all um, on Tuesday or on af Monday afternoon. And um, I wouldn't even be that surprised if that didn't come up. You know, so I wouldn't I, I wouldn't focus all of my time, but I would just think, OK, I, I might as well focus somewhere. I might as well do one bit in a slightly more detail than another. And if as long as you're thinking about the ways in which we do um, the ways in which we do evaluations, how we actually treat our results, how we evaluate. And then we're going to talk about this and I don't want to give away Dr. Lemon's trick. Um, if we think about the way in which we actually do evaluations and everything like that, uh, then we can, you know, uh, we, we can evaluate all practicals. If we learn one or two practicals in a lot of detail, then we can use that knowledge to evaluate all practicals, can't we? No, there's going to be um, one more at five o'clock and then I'm going to do eight o'clock on the night before the exam. All right, everybody, that's me now. Um, I'm enjoyed it up to this point. I'm starting to rethink really what I want to study at, at uh, uni now from physics to something else. Okay, so is that perhaps because of exams? In which case, I'd really encourage you to persevere with physics because... Um, it doesn't it, if you if you enjoy the practicals and the project side then university ends up being more like that and you can pick and choose how much of the tricky mathsy stuff you want to get into more at university really after first year first year is like basically covering everything at a slightly higher level than than um a level and then after that there's uh you know <laughs> after that there's there's kind of really driving your own learning and doing your own projects and thinking about the interesting stuff. If you've enjoyed doing any project work or experimental work, then I definitely recommend doing uh, physics as a degree. Every year, my teacher does a math class before the papers and he's predicted one question every year he has done it, eerie stuff. So can you tell us what he's predicted for this one? <laughs> yeah, exactly, thanks, Axa. Right, everyone, I'll see you again soon. Then I'm gonna be back with Dr. Lemon's um, secret tip. Uh, which won't be so secret at five o'clock. All right, see you then.